God and Father, we thank thee for that wonderful man who now sits in the glory of the blessed Lord Jesus. We thank thee that thou didst freely give him. He came and he didst glorify thee here in this scene. And now he sits at thy right hand in the glory. And in the soon coming day, he shall be given his rightful place in this scene where he was rejected. We pray this afternoon that we would with on shod feet as we consider afresh this blessed, wonderful man who fills thine own eyes and thine own heart. And we pray that we might get a fresh glimpse of him this afternoon. He might fill our eyes and our heart. For he is indeed a man of thy counsels. So we give thee thanks. We pray that the Spirit of God would lead us on in our deliberations together as we consider him, whom to know is life eternal. We ask this in his worthy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Our topic for this evening as was mentioned is behold the man and strange as it would seem in a world in which there are millions hundreds of millions maybe billions of men our attention would be called to consider just one man. I suppose some might say, and it would be a fair question, which man? Uh, if I turn this a little bit. Which man? And I suppose that would be a fair question. And the other question that comes to mind is for what purpose? Now, this world presents to us men that they consider important. This world would have us remember or elevate men that are considered men of renown because of their abilities or because of their achievements. And oftentimes, many men would call attention to themselves. Look at me. Look at what I have done. Look at what I could do. So this afternoon, when we think of beholding the man, the danger oftentimes is that people are occupied with the wrong man. I want us to turn this afternoon our first scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, from verse 21. For since by man came death, by man 
came also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And then I want to look at verse 45. And on our outline, actually, it's verse 45 that I should that I have in mind. And so, as it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a life-giving spirit. We read of the first Adam and the last Adam. We read of the second man. It seems as if of all the men in scripture that the word of God would bring our attention to two men. A first man and a second man. The first Adam and the last Adam. And one would wonder why is it that only two men would be brought to our attention. I was thinking that we have the first Adam, the first man Adam. And oftentimes men would uh, 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 spend time considering the history of man. And oftentimes they would spend countless hours researching the origin of man and where we have come from. And by the way, um, all the scientists and all the, the theories that has to do with where we have come from, here we have the authoritative, um, uh, uh, the word of God that gives the authority on uh, the origin of man, the history of man. And the Bible says the first man, Adam. I would like us to take a few minutes and look at this first man as we also consider a second man. And you wonder why a first man and a second man. What of all the other men who have come after Adam? As if the scripture simply passes over them. The Spirit of God simply uh, passed them over all and speaks of a second man. And also a first Adam and a last Adam. Not a second Adam, a last Adam. And I think it's because, as we have noticed, all the men who have followed Adam have taken character. All the men who have followed Adam have taken character from him. They're all, as it were, the scripture puts them under one group. And so when we notice the first man, Adam, the Bible says he is the responsible man. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 1 and consider for a moment this first man, Adam. If we speak of beholding the man, oftentimes, we are occupied with this first man. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. 
So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, created he him, male and female, and God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And the Lord said, and, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb for seed, bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree which is upon, which is in the earth for fruit, yielding seed after its kind, and, you sh and it, to you it shall be for food. Now my point is this, that God created the earth. We read in chapter 1 that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And we notice that out of a scene of chaos, a scene of death and destruction and lifelessness that God is acting. And God brings in order and he brings in life and he brings in light and fruitfulness. And God's fair creation, he heads up under a man. He brings in a man. And he heads up his creation onto this man. And he puts him in a place of superiority. He puts him in a place of responsibility also. But he puts him in a sovereign place. We read that God created man in his own image and in his likeness. And so we find that Adam... He could represent God to creation, but also Adam could present God to creation. There was a man who stood, as it were, as God's representative in this scene, in this scene of his creation. And so we read that everything is headed up under a man. This is God's thoughts. That man would be in this place of elevation, so to speak, and things would be headed up. He would be put in a place of dominion and authority. But we also read in chapter 2 that God put him under responsibility. And so we find that God said in chapter 2, verse 15, The Lord God took man, put him in the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Out of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So we have the response of a man. God put him in a place of dominion, and power, and superiority over the animals, but he had to recognize a greater authority. He had to recognize that he was under God's authority. Now, in this fair scene in which man was put, this responsible man, the next thought we have before us is that this responsible man fails. The first man, Adam, made in the image of God, and as I noticed before, despite the theories of evolution and the theories of science that speaks of, of man evolving, the Bible says that Adam was the first man. He was superior to the beast of the field 
science today would give us the, uh, the idea as if man evolved from lower forms of life. But what the Bible says is that he is superior in intelligence. He named all the animals. He is over them. He is given dominion over them. And he is the first man. Now as we consider the history of the first man, we see that there is failure. He's put in a place of responsibility, but now we find this first man is a disobedient man. In chapter 3 of Genesis, we read that the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Here we find the woman in verse 2 said to the serpent, We may eat of the tree of the fruit of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which in the midst of the garden, God had said, You shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be open and you shall be as God. God had created man in his own image and gave him dominion in this scene of his fair creation, put him in a place of dignity. And now we find that the enemy comes. And what we find, man acting contrary to the word of God and to the mind of God, to the will of God. That man would set aside the word of God, his creator. And man would listen to the enemy. Now the enemy would question, would cause man to question the word of God. In verse 3, hath God said. And oftentimes when there is failure, it begins with questioning the word of God. Did God really say? Man would question the word of God. In questioning the word of God, man would make God a liar. Man would question the love of God. The enemy suggests God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be open. You are going to become as God. What's the principle there? As if God is holding back something from man. As if God does not have the best in store for man. As if God's purpose for man is to keep him in a place of ignorance. As if God's purpose for man was to keep him in a place of inferiority. Now, when you know this, that the purpose and plan of God for man was to bring man in and to put him in a place of dominion, superiority over his creation. But the enemy would suggest that God was holding back something. 
when you are when you eat your eyes are going to be open and you are going to be elevated there is something to be gained and you know this is always the trick of the enemy the lie of the enemy the other thing he suggests in verse 4 you shall not surely die. God had said, the day you eat, you will die. And the enemy says, God is not going to keep his word. He is not going to do what he says. And that is still the trick of the enemy today. He tries to trick man into thinking that God is not going to do what he says in his word he's going to do. And so man listens to the enemy. And this first man, Adam, this responsible man, he acts in disobedience. He is put in a fair creation. And he fails. And what is the result? If we look at this first man, what we find, chapter 3, verse 10, <clears throat> verse 9, The Lord called unto Adam, said unto him, Where art thou? He said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And so we find the results of man's failure. There is shame. There is fear. He hides from the presence of God. He seeks to excuse himself. You look at verse 12. The man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me. In other words, he says, You know, uh, Lord, you're the one who gave me this woman. And now, this is what is the result. And so he excuses himself and seeks to blame another. And what do we find when we look at verse 17 to 19? There is a curse. There is sorrow. There is death spoken of. And man is driven out from this fair paradise in which he was put. You know, today when we look around, we see man is ever seeking to get back into paradise. And some even try to make their own little paradise here below, away from God. And outside of that place where God would have them to be. So this first man, Adam, when we look at him at the beginning of creation, God had put everything under him and put him in a place of authority and dominion. And by the end of chapter 3, we find that man failed under the best of conditions. This first man of whom we have spoken. Fallen. He is now the head of a fallen race. Chapter 5, verse 3, very quickly, we read that he... Adam was 130 years old. He begot a son in his own likeness and after his own image, and he called his name Seth. So we said scripture spoke of only a first man and a second man. Because Adam now, he got a son in his fallen image tainted by sin after his likeness and 
all other men since have been thus affected. You know, there is one man I'm reminded of in Luke 8, I believe, the publican, who when he stood up to pray, he says, I'm not as other men. Remember? He thought he was different. The word of God says, all have sinned. They have all come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. We all have taken character from this first man, Adam. And the question is, now what? Does God's plan for man, is it thwarted? Man is fallen. He is driven out of paradise. Just look around and it, you can see there are signs all over telling us we are not in paradise. Death and sorrow and everything else tells us we are not in paradise. Man is driven out. And so what of God's plan? Dear ones, it sets the scene for a second man. It sets the scene for another man after a different order. And so we, we come to the point at the end of Genesis 3, we have seen man. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we look Genesis chapter 3, the end of chapter 3, verse 22. The Lord God said, Behold the man. When we look at the man at this time, the end of Genesis, what do we say? A ruined state. There is need for another. There is a principle in scripture. I think we have it in Hebrews. That if the first fulfilled the purpose for which it was intended, there is no reason to bring in a second. If the first accomplishes that for which it was Made, there is no reason for a second. So when we read in Corinthians of a second man, as far as God is concerned, he is setting aside the first man. He is bringing in a second. Now this second man is also the last Adam. It doesn't say he's the second Adam. It's not going to be a whole slew of them. It's not going to be a whole group, the one after the other. There is the second man and the last Adam. This head of a new race. Now, when we turn to this second man, the last Adam, which is what we would like to speak about this afternoon. I would like for us, first of all, to turn to John's Gospel. We started off by saying that the danger is we become occupied with the wrong man. And so in John's Gospel, chapter 4, we read of a woman 
She is the woman of Samaria, remember? And we read how she spoke the Lord Jesus, he must needs go through Samaria. And how he stopped and he speaks with this woman. And in their conversation, she mentions that, you know, our fathers worship in the mountains. And you Jews, you say that Jerusalem is the place to worship. And the Lord speaks with her. And the, the woman says in verse um, 25, The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And then we read in verse 29, In verse 26, it says, Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And then in verse 29, we read that the woman leaves a water pot in verse 28. And she runs into the village. She runs into the city. And she says unto the men of the city, come see Amen. I would like for you this afternoon to follow this woman and to see the man she wants to point out to you. Dear friends, I think this woman calls her attention to the man promise. The sent one. Oh, that you and I would follow this woman. Of all the men that have walked this scene, she calls attention to one man. She says, come see one man. Is not this the Christ? This is the man there one. I hope the Spirit of God would engage your heart and mind with this afternoon that we might see Jesus. In the beginning of John's Gospel, we read of John the Baptist so blind were the men of that day that, as it were, God had to send a forerunner to tell them that this is he. That there was need for a forerunner. That the eyes of those in Jerusalem might be pointed to this man who comes. And so John the Baptist comes and he says, this is he. Now, in John's Gospel, chapter 1, just a few portions quickly. We don't have time to read the whole section. But we read it in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and that the Word was God. All things were made by Him and for Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And we have the Lord Jesus presented that He, uh, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. And now we read of this man, John, who was sent from God. The same came to bear witness of that light. To all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness, to call attention to 
to point your attention and mine to this man. Now, the wonderful thing when I note with, read this portion, if you look in verse um, John mentions again and again. Uh, he says, uh, <clears throat> verse 15, John bore witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spoke. He says, He that cometh after me. He is preferred before me. This is the preferred man, so to speak. John says, you know, he's coming after, but he's really preferred before me. John says, John himself says, I must decrease. And this one, he must increase. He uses this expression over and over. Um, If we go through this portion, we will notice where over and over he uses this expression that he, uh, uh, he that cometh after me is preferred before me. Verse 30, he says, After me cometh a man. After me cometh a man, and this man, he is preferred before me. See, John is a good witness of the Lord Jesus. Many men would seek to elevate themselves, even at the expense of seeking to pull the Lord Jesus down. But John says, I cannot be compared to this one. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and to untie. This is the man that the woman of Samaria calls attention to. This is the man that John the Baptist points out. In John chapter 9, we read there of a blind man. It says <clears throat> in verse uh, 10, they ask him, how were thine eyes opened? In verse 11, he answered and said, a man called Jesus. A man called Jesus. There ones this afternoon. This is the man the Spirit of God would have you and I 
engaged with. That we might see Jesus. Remember those Greeks who came and asked, Sirs, we would see Jesus. He says, a man called Jesus. He made claim. He opened my eyes. Now, as we go through this portion, we find that um, <clears throat> verse 16, therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God. Because he keepeth not the Sabbath. They said unto the blind man in verse 17, what Sayest thou of him? He says he's a prophet. We go on down and we come uh, in verse um, 24. Then again they called the man that was blind, said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, whether he's a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I say. Then said they unto him again, what did he do to thee? How opened he thine eyes? Now, here this blind man. He answered them. I have told you already, he says. Will you not hear why would you why would ye hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? They reviled him. Now verse 30. The man answered and said unto them. Why? Here is a marvelous thing. That you know not from whence he is. And yet he had opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the age begun, was it heard? Was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was blind? If this man were not of God, he could do. blind man recognized that this was not an ordinary man. A blind man. Now, our topic, behold a man. Which man are we talking about? A blind man recognized that this is no ordinary man. The Pharisees and the leaders, they couldn't figure it out. They keep calling him again and again. What do you say of him? He says he's got to be a prophet. He's got to be a man of God. He's got to be a worshiper of God. If this man, if God was not with this man, he could do nothing. He is the preeminent man. He is no ordinary man. This is the man there once this afternoon. We want to take a few minutes to look at. This is the man that the Spirit of God would bring to your attention and mine. You know, as we go through life, it seems that we're always in a hustle and a bustle. We're always in a hurry. And in the midst of all of this, someone says to you, Behold the man. And you say, For what reason? For what cause? Which man? There's so many men around. But this is no ordinary man. 
It demands your attention and mine. The Spirit of God would have us to pause and to consider this man. Now he is the second man. <clears throat> he is perfect in manhood. All the other men who have walked this wilderness scene never was there a man that God in heaven could look down on with joy and the light. Never before there was one who walked this wilderness scene that satisfied all that God ever looked for in man. Never before was one who, as it were, represented all that God had in mind when he created man and put him in that place of dominion. We read that he made him a little lower than the angels. What is man? That thou art mindful of him. And son of man, that thou visitest him. Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Now, God's purpose for man was not what the enemy suggested. To keep him in blind ignorance. To keep him in a place of inferiority. That was not God's purpose for man. This is realized in this second man. A blessed Lord Jesus. And so we want to see him this afternoon. To behold him <clears throat> as the perfect man. So if in your outlines you would notice. We want to first behold him as the perfect man. He is perfect in manhood. You know there are many today who would question the, the, um, the manhood of the Lord Jesus. But we read in scripture, we read in the scriptures that he came, he was born of the virgin, and he was perfectly man. When he came here below and he was born in this world, he was God and man in one divine person. He is perfectly man, but he's also the perfect man. And so in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 3, At the beginning of the ministry of our blessed Lord Jesus, we read in verse 16, <clears throat> verse 13 for connection, then cometh Jesus from Galilee to John to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou unto me? Jesus answered, said unto him, Permit it to be so now, for it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. 
verse 16. Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning on him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God the Father in heaven would testify of his pleasure in this man. Never before we read of Adam who was put in God's fair creation. Everything was in his favor. And he dishonors God. He questions God's love and God's righteousness. He questioned God's word. He dishonored God, as it were. But here, our blessed Lord Jesus, God would testify of his delight, of his pleasure in a man. This man, Christ Jesus. We would read of others speaking of him. But I want us to begin right at the beginning and think of God's supreme delight in this one as he walked here below. At the beginning of his ministry, we have this declaration of God's delight, his pleasure in this perfect man. When we come to chapter 17 of this same book, we read in verse 5. We can read from verse 1 for connection. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them into a high mountain privately. And he was transfigured before them. His face did shine like the sun. His raiment was as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias speaking with him, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make Three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. This is God's testimony. This is heaven's. I see. This is heaven. Testimony, commentary on this blessed, wonderful man. God would open heaven and he would declare his delight, God's delight. How can we be occupied with any other man? Here 
ye him. He is the one worth listening to. Of all the voices. Of all who is calling attention to themselves. God says. This is my son. I'm well pleased with him. Hear ye him. I was just signaled that our time is gone. But I hope in the... <clears throat> Second part, we could develop a little bit more something of this wonderful, blessed man that uh, the Spirit of God would call our attention to this afternoon to behold this man. Should we close in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Lord Jesus. We thank thee that thou didst come into such a scene as this. Thou wast a man amongst men. Never before was one here who had the interests of God the Father at heart as thou didst. We hear thee saying, that I must be about my father's business. And we hear thee saying, Lord Jesus, I have glorified thee on this earth. And we pray this afternoon that we might see something of thy precious, wonderful person. The Spirit of God would give us a fresh glimpse of thyself, Lord Jesus, in thy per perfect pathway here below that we might see a little bit of thy suffering, the price thou was willing to pay. But also we pray that this afternoon we might see something of the place where thou now occupies in the glory, and that we might bow and worship and give thee the praise and the adoration that is rightly thine. As we ask these things in thine own worthy and precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.